Welcome to our Gold Breakout Special Series of Interviews at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. To illustrate the gravity of this time for investors, George Soros, for all of the controversy surrounding his globalist agendas, is one of the best traders of the 20th century. One of his great truisms is called the one-way bet, which means that at certain times we know that the market might head in a certain direction, but it definitely will not head in the other way. In other words, it will either go up, for example, or do nothing at all. This is when the downside risk is greatly diminished and when George Soros places his bets. Right now, we are in such a time. We know that interest rates are going down, so many investors are buying bonds and gold, but the rally itself has not yet started because the Fed has not cut interest rates. So it is a great time for gold investors, and the spot price is nearing a five-year high. Today, we are welcoming to the show Mr. Ronald Peter Stuffele. Ronnie is an Austrian fund manager and a world-renowned expert on gold. Ronnie is a partner at Incrementum and the author of the yearly In Gold We Trust reports, which have become essential for gold investors around the world. We're excited to have him on the show today to explore this year's gold report with the incredible charts. Everyone can download their own free copy of this year's In Gold We Trust report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Ron. Ronnie, welcome to the show. How are you today? <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm very, very well. How are you? I am great, and we're excited to have you here. Ronnie, the main theme of your report this year is the political bear market, the transition from small government to populist government, and from trust to distrust, which is reflected in your chart on page seven. People around the world have been expressing their anger with policies that favor the system over the well-being of citizens. And this is a major theme currently throughout the world. From your perspective, does lack of trust in a government manifest itself in politics or in the markets? And what does history tell us about this process? Well, uh, I, I think we're, we're all over the globe seeing a big crisis when it comes to uh, trust in, 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 in politicians, in political parties, uh, in political systems. And, and it, it is not only a development that we're seeing um, in the U.S., we're seeing it all over the globe that populists on the very right side of the spectrum, but also on the very left side of the spectrum, um, they are winning elections. So the center completely breaks away and we're seeing more and more of a polarization of our society. And we're quoting quite a lot of studies in our report that clearly show that trust in governments is, is, is eroding. And, and there's many signs that are quite worrisome from my point of view. So for, for, for example, among millennials, Confidence in democracy is completely waning. So Neil Howe, he said, millennials are the least likely to actually think that democracy is important. A lot of millennials look at democracies today and they see these governments which seem to be perennially dysfunctional. All they do is borrow from our future. They do not invest in our future. And there are studies coming out of Harvard, for example, saying that actually the later the interviewees were born, the lower their confidence in democratic institutions and the greater their desire for strong leaders. So we're seeing this polarization of society. We're seeing this loss of, loss of trust in the political system, but we're also seeing it in the media. We're seeing it sometimes in sports with all the doping scandals. We're seeing it with large multinational companies, for example, all over here in Europe, the Volkswagen scandal, the whole emission scandal. And one area where we still see pretty high trust is trust in central bankers, in the financial system, in banks, and also in the crisis management um, of um, the central bankers. But the interesting thing about trust is it is highly asymmetrical. So it takes 
often years, decades, centuries to build up that trust. But then just within a few moments, a few days, this trust is gone. So this asymmetry of trust means that the fear of loss triggers greater, faster, and stronger reactions than the expectation of gain. And from my point of view, at some point, we will see that the market realizes the emperor has no clothes. All this talk of normalization of interest rates, all the talk of, you know, everything is fine now after the JFC, all this will, it, it, market participants will realize that we only borrowed from the future and that actually the next crisis will probably be uh, significantly um, uh, bigger than 2008 and that also the measures that will be taken by central bankers and politicians will even be more aggressive than the measures that they, they have taken in the previous crisis. Democracy really isn't the enemy. It's the people that have gotten in at the top that have completely destroyed it. And for those that are coming up, all they see is that result. We could also dig a bit deeper from my point of view. Um, this, this, this whole polarization and, and, and this big gap between the haves and the have nots and, and, and sometimes this big gap, um, between, um, wealth in, in cities, um, versus, um, the, the more rural areas. This is a consequence of our monetary system. It is a consequence of the so-called Cantillon effect. So actually, if you're, um, if you're early on in the whole, uh, production of new money in inflation, um, then you profit from it. While, um, when, when, when you are uh, at a later stage, you suffer from it because you, you have to deal with, with rising prices and you don't profit from the massive asset price inflation that we have seen. And, and, and I mean, Michelle, let's not forget, we're in the middle of this everything bubble. Um, we, we talked about that already in the last year's report, but now we're seeing stock markets um, basically at an all-time high or close to all-time highs. We're seeing bond markets close to all-time highs. We've never seen, uh, like at the moment, 12 trillion um, in, 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 in bonds at negative yields. We're seeing that real estate markets all over the globe um, are at their all-time highs. We're seeing the art market going crazy. So it is definitely a consequence of um, the, the, the massive measures that were taken by the central banks. So basically, um, 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 dramatically lowering rates, introducing quantitative easing. Let's not forget that central bankers, um, created 18 trillion US dollars out of thin air. Of course, this had an impact, but actually the income share of the top 1%, we're comparing that from 1915 to 2017, that's uh, on page 328 of the report, and it shows that since 1971, since Nixon temporarily suspended the convertibility of the US dollar, we have never seen a higher level, so an, a, a more extreme income share of the top 1%. So from my point of view, if the next crisis happens, I think, you know, when we remember the whole uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, that was a fairly peaceful thing. I think in the next crisis, I think um, um, we will see um, developments like, for example, in France with the, with the yellow vest. I think it's, 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 it's the society is much, much more polarized also due to the monetary measures that were taken to fight the crisis. Now, Ronnie, staying with the U.S. dollar for just a moment and going from a global perspective, China, Russia, and India are all forming an alliance, and they're using resources to increase the backing of their currency into gold. Together, India and China represent about 40% of the global population, and they appear to be moving away from the dollar. The process might be lengthy, perhaps 20 years, but from your vantage point, what does the next one to seven year time span look like for the US dollar? Well, 
My friend Rick Rule once said, the dollar is a big lie, but it's a very, very liquid lie. So um, everybody's saying that, you know, the Chinese renminbi will take over the US dollar um, in its role as world reserve currency. I think that's just wrong and, 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 and it's, it, it's a bit, bit naive to say something like that because the US dollar is still by far the most important Currency. It is a very liquid, very deep capital market, um, very sophisticated market. Um, but we are also seeing, and, and this is actually a trend that we're describing uh, in our report for many years now. And it seems that the whole de dollarization topic is now really becoming mainstream. I had an interview with Bloomberg recently, and, and, and actually two years ago, uh, I would have never expected Bloomberg to call me up to discuss the de-dollarization. So it's really becoming sort of, of, of mainstream now. And we have seen last year, for example, that central banks bought the, the, the highest amount of gold since 1971. We're seeing this repatriation trend of gold. So people or, or countries are bringing back their gold reserves into their own countries, which is also a sign of this loss of trust in international relations, I would say. And, and we're seeing now, actually, and, and this is really something that we haven't seen in the last couple of years, that um, that, that actually really big players, big uh, important politicians are now talking about de-dollarization. So, for, for, for example, there was, there was Jean-Claude Juncker saying that um, it, is, it is actually um, quite, uh, quite strange that, um, that, uh, uh, that, that the Eurozone is importing, uh, I think, 80% uh, of, 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 of its oil or energy um, and paying for it in US dollar terms. So uh, the Eurozone is actually working um, on some sort of, 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 of new system. They also want to introduce uh, an alternative to the Swiss SWIFT system because that's something that's really interesting. Donald Trump really actively um, uses um, the payment system um, to, to, to apply pressure, for example, on Iran, uh, and he wants to do it perhaps also on Russia. So um, the, the European Union is, is actually showing that um, um, the, some sort of small uprising. So Juncker said the euro must become the face and instrument of a new, more sovereign Europe. And, and I think this is something that really, really changed over the last couple of years. And from my point of view, gold plays a major role in that de-dollarization game. Uh, Iran plays a, a, a huge role. China plays a root, huge role. Uh, and Russia plays a huge role. And it's no coincidence that all those big uh, countries and currency blocks, they are already having quite a lot of gold, like the Eurozone, more than 10,000 tons of gold, or they're massively buying gold. So I think for in, 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 in the face from one world currency to another world currency, gold will really be the decisive factor like it has always been over, 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 over the, um, the monetary history. And, and I think the fact that the U.S. had roughly 30,000 tons of gold back in the days was one of the main reasons why it was accepted as the new world leading currencies um, in, uh, uh, after the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement. One of your most outstanding charts is on page 27, and it shows the milligram coverage of the euro in ounces of gold, and it's almost unbelievable. The devaluation in only 20 years is showing a 77% decrease. In other words, gold would be five times more expensive to back the euro today than in 1999. Do you believe that the euro has a future? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think that, first of all, we, we, we have to say that um, I think the sentiment when it comes to the euro is extremely negative. All over the world where I travel, everybody says, you know, the euro is dead. Uh, we've got all those, those issues. 
um, in France, in Italy, in Greece, and so on. Uh, Germany is on the verge of a recession. We've got the Brexit. Um, we've got a political crisis. Um, from my point of view, this is all priced in. So, so everybody knows about that. Um, it is pretty interesting from my point of view that the whole Eurozone in 2018 had uh, a, a pretty, pretty small um, 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 deficit. So, so last year in 2018, the total budget deficit of the entire Eurozone was 67 billion US dollars. Uh, Germany, for example, recorded a staggering uh, government surplus of, of 58 billion um, uh, euros. While on the other side of the pond, um, the US uh, is, is facing dramatic budget deficits. I think last year it was roughly 800 billion. Um, so, so, so from a relative basis, I think uh, 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 we should not forget that many countries in the Eurozone, they, they really um, made their lesson, they, they significantly improved. Even Greece, if you have a look at their numbers, um, it's, 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 it's pretty encouraging. But on the other hand, um, we just published a book called Die Nullzinsfalle, which is German for the zero interest rate trap. And, you know, we have seen from Mario Draghi, uh, he will probably go down in history books as one of the very few central bankers that never raised interest rates. So um, I think, you know, in, in, in fighting the crisis and, 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 and the period afterwards, I think that, that especially the ECB painted itself into a corner while the Federal Reserve at least has some leeway to reduce rates, to lower rates, because on average, in the course of a recession, rates are lowered by 500 basis points. We're still basically at zero in the Eurozone. So when a recession hits, and from my point of view, this will happen very soon, um, then the ECB has to take even more drastic measures. And at, and at some point, of course, the Eurozone could break up. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I think that we, 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 we should not forget that uh, the US dollar also has significant problems. So um, I do favor actually gold over those all those fiat currencies. And it is fascinating. Uh, I mean, gold is doing so well in most currencies. And, and this is actually something that uh, the market participants don't really appreciate. Gold is up roughly 5% in dollar terms since the beginning of the year. It is close uh, close to new all-time highs in Australian dollars. It is close to all-time highs in Canadian dollars. It is up 7% in Swiss francs. It is up 8% in euro terms. It's up 7% in British pound terms. So gold is in a bull market already, but nobody really recognizes it yet. Wow, that's brilliant news though. That is, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, from my point of view, we're just, you know, we're just at a, at a very, very um, early stage of this bull market. So, so I think, you know, Michelle, um, the, the, the very, uh, the, the, the fourth quarter 2018 was a big warning shot for investors. We should not forget that December was the worst performing month for the S&P since the Great Depression. And, and actually, all asset classes were basically down in the fourth quarter, but gold was up 7% and mining stocks were up 17%. So gold perfectly did what it is supposed to do. It acted as a, as a perfect portfolio hedge. And, and therefore, I think that, you know, once those cracks in the market will get bigger and once the market realizes that the Federal Reserve will have to significantly lower rates and we're already on this, uh, on this trend, on this monetary U-turn trend, and once the market realizes that there will be more QE MMT, negative rates, whatever, I think this, this gold will be one of the very, very few asset classes that will really, really profit from that environment. Yes. Now, Germany, 
as a country because of their own history has a fear of inflation as opposed to the US Federal Reserve which is terrified of deflation like in the Great Depression of 1929 so the Fed keeps inflating bubbles on page 13 of your In Gold We Trust report and on your website, we can see the current bubble. The issue with asset bubbles is that they mostly provide riches to the rich, not to the middle class or the lower income people. Ronnie, how big is this current bubble that you just mentioned? And what asset classes are most overvalued? Well, it is probably the, 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 the biggest bubble in, in history. Um, I, I think we should not forget that this is not a, a, a local bubble um, that is uh, just in, in, in one or a few countries um, and that is uh, only in one or a few asset classes, but a, a much bigger and broader bubble that we're in at the moment. And of course, central banks uh, 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 created that bubble like, like they always did. And, and, and they are mainly responsible for those boom and bust cycles as the Austrian business cycle theory, of course, um, always suggested. So f f from my point of view, um, as I've said before, we're in the everything bubble. We have seen the first cracks of this everything bubble. But on the other hand, um, uh, the Federal Reserve always mentions this, uh, this wealth effect. So the importance of the stock market and the real estate market for um, for um, 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 consumer confidence and, and, and for the economy. So uh, from my point of view, Donald Trump will do everything he can um, to not let this bubble burst before the election in 2020 and to not fall into a recession um, before the election. So can it, can it uh, 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 go on longer? Of course. Um, but of course, the longer it takes, um, the more um, uh, dramatic will the will be the bust stage of this um, uh, of this cycle. Um, from my point of view, you know, a recession is something something normal, something healthy. But we we try to avoid and 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 to um, 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 get rid of this economic cycle for so long that. I think this reallocation process will, will really be painful. Now, we have three special reports for everyone where we covered these explosive subjects. They can be downloaded at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Trump, PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Fed, and PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Enemy. We've highlighted and stressed that the central banks all over the world are deflating and doing QT on a global basis. Now, Ronnie, on page 14 of your gold report, you present an astonishing mean reversion chart that shows in comparison to historical averages, the S&P 500 would need to decline by 44% while the commodities index rise by 112% to restore equilibrium. Do you foresee a commodities bull market or simply a swift equities crash, or both? Uh, well, it can also be both, of course. Well, th this chart that, that we're showing, in all, it basically only shows that, um, you know, for, for a long-term comparison, um, stocks are, are, are rather rather expensive, rather dear, while commodities are just dirt cheap. Um, I think one of the iron laws of, 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 of investing and of markets is the mean reversion and and if we just would mean revert to that linear trend line um those would be staggering moves as you've said 44 percent down for the s p and more than 100 percent up for the commodities markets and and i think we're also showing some some much uh, longer term charts and it's actually pretty fascinating since the the year 1900 for example um you can have a look at at, at, at that chart um, uh, on page 46 of the report, uh, it basically shows that commodities relative to the Dow Jones um, only have been that 
inexpensive, that cheap since the year 1960. And actually, we compare um, the, 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 the two phases the 1970s and the 2000s. Uh, and actually there, when, when, when commodities were so cheaply valued compared to equities and, and then enter the secular bull market, and it's pretty fascinating that there are big parallels between the 1970s and the 2000s because um, especially compared to nowadays because each time an expansionary monetary policy fed a period of booming stock markets. Then subsequently a decade of surging commodity prices set in. So we have seen that back in the days in the 60s, we've seen the nifty 50 and the, in the 2000s, we've seen the dot coms, of course. And now we're seeing the fang stocks as well as the unlisted unicorns. The decade before was basically characterized by extremely um, expansive or, 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 or aggressive monetary policy. And from my point of view, I think there could be a reallocation from financial assets into real assets. And actually, when I'm talking to market participants, nobody is really bullish on commodities at the moment. Yeah. So, so, so I always hear the same stupid arguments and, and actually, Long commodities would also be uh, pretty similar to the short dollar trade. And at the moment, it seems the dollar camp is still fairly strong. Um, and from my point of view, we will see a, a lower dollar over the next couple of years. Speaking on that subject and bringing in gold underneath it, does this mean that gold bugs are right? They're just maybe three to six years too early and the rally is not yet imminent, but it's coming? What's your opinion? Well, of course, the, the bear market already um, uh, lasts for quite a while and then much longer than, than most people probably expected. Um, on the other hand, I think that the this, this kind of divergence between the mar what, what the market is actually doing and what, um, what uh, 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 the, the, the market is discounting and the media is seeing because most of the people think that gold is completely dead. Um, I, I, I like this kind of divergence. And, you know, just, just, just one comparison. Um, in 2011, um, back in the days, I remember when gold was trading at 1900, every Wall Street bank was extremely bullish. So they had price targets at 2,500 up to 3,000 US dollars per ounce. Now, most of the Wall Street banks are slightly negative uh, or pretty neutral on gold. Nobody really cares about gold at the moment. And I think, you know, gold actually did what it, what it had to do because we should not forget that the opportunity costs of holding gold were pretty high. So we have seen that stock markets were doing, are still doing pretty well. Volatility is still pretty low. We're seeing that real estate is doing well, that trust in the financial system and in banks is relatively high. We're seeing relatively low price inflation and we have seen rising rates and quantitative tightening. So in that environment, you should not expect gold to rally. But this is changing now. And, and therefore, I think that Gold is in the early stages of a bull market. I think we're going from this accumulation phase to the public participation phase. And of course, at the end of this phase, there is um, the acceleration phase, but we are far away from that. I think it's a, it's a pretty decent risk-reward perspective. Wonderful. How far out do you think we are from the actual rally on gold? Well, um, that's, that's, that, that's a good question. From my point of view, um, everybody is staring at this massive resistance at 1360 to 1380. I'm a bit concerned regarding the, the current commitment of traders report. So um, I think that we won't uh, rally above that resistance zone in the next couple of days, next couple of weeks. But I think as soon as we're over, and that could happen in fall in, or in late summer, because actually in, in, in pre-election years, gold has an extremely strong seasonality. And this seasonality really kicks in beginning of August. Uh, and then uh, accelerates uh, mid mid of August, 
Um, so, so I think we can go to 1450, 1500 pretty quickly as soon as we're above this resistance zone. And then, of course, the media will pick up again. Um, uh, then, of course, um, I think the, the, the analysts will get more positive. Then I think all the small miners will have more access to capital again because for, for them at the moment, it's really hard to raise any capital. Um, so, so I think then gold would really become bit more mainstream again and let's not forget you know in the bull market from 2000 2001 up until 2011 um, at some point you know every private bank every wealth manager said you know you should have at least five to ten percent gold we're so far away from that at the moment but this is going to happen over the course of a bull market because nowadays nobody is really acting as a contrarian anymore. Everybody is sort of a trend follower. And, and therefore, I think this, this bull market will develop and we're in very early stages of, 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 of that development. So you believe the election could be um, a trigger? It, it is definitely a, a factor going forward. Um, and I think that the whole MMT, modern monetary theory, that is becoming so much more popular nowadays on the left, but also on the right side of the spectrum, this might also be a big trigger because, you know, with MMT, you can, you can have it all. Yeah. You can have uh, the Green New Deal. You can have, uh, you can finance new wars. You can finance free college tuition, uh, free healthcare, whatever. So just, Pick whatever you want. And, and it seems that this idea is really gaining popularity. And, and, and from my point of view, one of the key takeaways would probably be that the, basically the decade-long bond rally might really quickly end and, 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 and we would see higher yields, higher inflation rates. So, 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 so I think we should expect much more of those fiscal uh, stimulus measures. I think that's also one of the insights. If you study the communication by central banks, they say, okay, we have basically done everything in the last crisis. We could do a bit, can do a bit more, but now politicians and fiscal policy has to take over. So in the course of the next crisis, I expect much more direct measures such as MMT or helicopter money, something like that. Perhaps the terms will be different, but more direct measures, which would probably have a much more inflationary impact on the markets. We want to wrap it up with page 50 of your gold report, because I think this is fascinating. We see the various expenditures of Washington and how its interest obligations have remained quite low for decades, but mm -hmm. the mandatory spending is really on the rise. So please speak to that just a little bit, Ronnie. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, David Hume already described uh, this, this, this decreasing room to, to maneuver in his essay, which was called On Public Credit in the year 1752. He said that an excess of debt leads to governments pledging virtually their entire future revenues and falling into a state of dullness and inability to act. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing this development where, of course, due to, to, to falling interest rates and refinancing at lower rates, this had an impact. But now we are seeing that uh, that that uh, uh, expenditures um, uh, on government debt they are rising. They are rising permanently. Um, it will be one of the. Uh, I think it will be the largest interest payments will be the largest expenditure already in two thousand and forty eight. And this just decreases um, the 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 room to maneuver for. The government. It is. It is uh, pretty pretty shocking to see and to study the forecasts by the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. So um, their forecasts, if you read them, they're they're extremely optimistic. One could also say they are a bit naive. For example, they 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 assume that the U.S. will not slide into a recession in the next ten years, 
and that the economy will grow by 3% annually, which is pretty bold, I would say, especially as the US economy has never experienced such a long upswing phase. And from my point of view, the fact that the CBO expects that uh, in the next 10 years, we will see every year budget deficits above 1 trillion US dollars. Even if there is no recession, and we all know what it's going to be in a recession, um, this already shows that this leeway for the government to to uh, invest kind of wisely, um, this is not existing anymore, and it will be become lower and lower. So um, we we are quoting Inspector Frank Drabin in the report who said truth hurts maybe not as much as jumping on a bicycle with the seat missing but it hurts so <laughs> we tried to show many many charts in the report showing this whole mess that we are in and from my point of view gold is one of the very few solutions out of this mess we want to remind everyone that you can download your own free copy of the in gold we trust report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash RON, that's R-O-N. This is a highly prestigious report that's become world-renowned and covers everything from gold to forecasts of central banks. It is extraordinary. And Ronnie, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell us about your company, your website, and how everyone can follow your work. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, well, um, yeah, the In Gold We Trust report really became one of the most widely followed publications on gold. We are publishing it every year uh, in an extended version, um, 340 pages, uh, and then also in a compact version, which is still 110 pages. Um, it, it is a very, very broad and holistic analysis of, of, of the gold market and of mining stocks. Um, at Incrementum, we are mainly doing fund management, asset management in the precious metal space. Um, in the real asset space, we're also doing uh, wealth management for high net worth individuals. And uh, we're also very active in the crypto space. So we've got, as a sister report to the annual in gold we trust report, we've got the quarterly um, um, crypto research report. And if you want to follow my work, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Ron Stoeferle and uh, have a look at our webpage, incrementum.li. And yeah, I, I hope you like it and I hope that I could give you uh, a brief overview and some insights into the 2019 In Gold We Trust report. Yes, this is a great preview and it's wonderful that you're now focusing in on cryptocurrencies because I know a lot of our audience is going to spring for that one. Um, name that one one more time and where they can find the cryptocurrencies report. Yeah, that's the Crypto Research Report, which is published by my colleagues Mark Wallach and Demelsa Hayes. Um, of course, you can have an interview with them anytime. Um, it's a quarterly publication because, of course, there's, uh, the sector is a bit more, um, let's say, dynamic like the gold sector. And there's so much going on on a daily basis. And, and, and there are many similarities between Bitcoin and gold. So for us, it was uh, pretty obvious that we... Um, already started writing about cryptos in 2013. We've been following the sector for quite a while and we basically want to do something similar like with the Gold with Trust report for the crypto space, publish high quality um, uh, research uh, in German and in English. And yeah, so, so check out the crypto research report published by my colleagues Mark Wallach and Demelsa Hayes. Highly valuable in both markets, both gold and cryptocurrencies are the aspect of your charts, which are brilliant. And when everyone sees this, because there's so much emotionalism that goes into not just gold, but cryptos. And as everyone agrees, when you go to the charts, <laughs> when everybody's going crazy, <laughs> go to the charts. Yeah. <laughs> guys are known for your charts. It's been amazing to have you on the show today. Thank you very much, Michelle. I really enjoyed it. I hope that you and your listeners enjoyed it as well. And yeah, I, I, I hope we're going to talk soon again. Yes, indeed. Mr. Ronald Peter Stuffele, Austrian investor, fund manager, and author of the In Gold We Trust report for the Gold Breakout special series of interviews. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.